So you mentioned you were, you were a teacher. I, was, I do a workshop on make your own seasonings. And I bring in 30 different like seasonings and I put them in a, around a table and everyone gets a bottle and the recipe and they get to go and you know pick their own seasonings and all that. So we were doing it and this, this woman came up to me and she said, I was a home economics teacher for 30 years and you were doing this all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I was like, oh really? Because I was a teacher too. So I said, okay. I said, what, what am I doing wrong? She said, well, the first thing is, she said, you gave everyone their own spoon. She said, so that means every spoon is going in every spice. If you put one spoon in each spice, they wouldn't cross contaminate. And I went, all right, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> then, she s- then she said, and you should list your recipes, the ingredients in alphabetical order, put them all in alphabetical order, and then put them around the table in alphabetical order so everyone's organized. And I was like, oh, that's a good one too. <laughs> so then I offered her a job, but she, <laughs> but she was retired. So, but, uh, well, so listen, we might as well get going. It looks like, oh, it's about one o'clock. So uh, welcome. I woke up this morning, and this is the first time in my life that I woke up and saw rain and went, yes, it's a soup day. So here we are, good soup day. Um, my name is Dave. Uh, this is Mike, who's helping me out, a good friend of mine, um, a very good friend of mine, willing to come here and serve soup for me on his day off, so that's nice. So, um, so anyway, so Therapy Gardens is my company. Uh, we work primarily with senior centers. Uh, we do some assisted livings. We work with some uh, over 55 communities, things like that, libraries. Lately, I've been getting into libraries and uh, garden clubs, things like that. But the, the, the bread and butter of, uh, of our business is senior centers. And I think I've been to, over the past two years, I think I've been to about 125 of them. So, yeah. So, and uh, it's nice. It's, it's great to see them all, but there's some disparity too. You know, some are, you know, like there's some small towns that I do my presentation, I share the room with like the knitting club. You know, and that and that and that's okay. I don't I don't mind. It doesn't bother me, but I think it bothered them. You know, so, um, so you guys are lucky. You have a really nice space here. This this is uh, real real nice. Uh, well, anyway, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, that first sa- sample that you had, that's tomato bisque. Um, I actually I made that last night, and I I find uh, with tomatoey things and one pot things and that stuff that overnight. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they're a little bit better the next day. So that's why I made that one last night. Um, that I will give you the recipe for. And as we kind of progress through the presentation, I, I just want to let you know that um, I'm more than happy to email the whole thing to you. So if, if you don't want to sit here and take notes or anything like that, all you have to do at, at some point, I'm going to send around and email a form to get your email addresses if you want to sign up for it. You don't have to. But just write on there if you're interested in, in you want the presentation and I'll send it to you. Um, okay, so, and then the, just the last thing kind of before we get going is um, questions, comments, uh, insults directed at Mike. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, th- it makes for a better presentation when, when people participate. So please, I, I want you to feel free to, uh, you know, if you have a comment, on something if you you know have a question please ask it and I, I'll tell you I go home after these presentations I pretty much have no life so I go home and you know I, I take the dog out because she's gonna cross legs by the time I get home today and um, I sit down with the presentation that I gave that day and I think about how it went and I think about you know and I made little changes and adjustments and I'll point out some things as I go through some things that I've learned from the crowd so I'm always, you know, more than happy to hear your your suggestions. So with that, um, you know, we uh, I already talked briefly about uh, the, our company's Therapy Gardens. We uh, we're based out of Brockton, um, and that's um, where is that? That is Attleboro. That was the um, I think I did. That's the main herb garden workshop we were doing in Attleboro. But I I noticed um, I highlight up here. We're always looking for new places to present, but we're always looking for new presenters, people that want to work with us. So if you're somebody who is, you know, uh, passionate or an enthusiasm for something 
and you think you might want to share it with others, please, you know, send me an email or give me a call. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. We've, um, we actually have a lot of people that uh, come kind of sign on with us and they say, you know, I just want to do, you know, maybe one a week or a couple of months, you know, in my own local area. And we're able to accommodate that. So, um, so anyway, let's talk about soup. So today we're going to learn about uh, making homemade stocks and broths. We're going to talk about using healthier ingredients to increase nutritional value. And I'm going to, I'm going to add something onto that without decreasing flavor. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, I, I was chatting with somebody up here earlier. Uh, the salt content of things that you buy that are shelf stable, canned soups, and well, I'm going to show you some of it anyway. Not that you don't know, you know, I'm sure you know. Um, so when I say healthier ingredients, I don't actually mean like, like tofu. I, I'm not talking about tofu. I, <laughs> I was married to a vegetarian, so she wasn't a vegetarian before we got married. And then she became one. It was like a bait and switch type deal. So <laughs> it was. Uh, uh, kidding aside, she she pushed me in a different direction occasionally. You know, uh, just occasionally. But um, so when I say healthier ingredients, I mean food, real food. That's what I mean is real food. I mean not something that's been you know processed at at 900 degrees in a can so that it can sit on a shelf and have have no flavor except saltiness i'm talking about you know real food so when i say healthier ingredients i mean fresh carrots as opposed to carrots that that have been you know gone through the canning process those are the types of things that i'm talking about um we'll talk about creating a variety of soups including some vegetarian soups um and then towards the end i like to go over what i call uh, healthy ish shortcuts um, you know, and one, one of the things is I'm going to show you how to make, uh, how I make stocks. You know, you might make it your, your own way, but the way I do it is it has to sit overnight and then, you know, you take the fat off the next, the next morning. Well, you don't always have the luxury of doing that. So that's why I try to find some healthy ish shortcuts. So some of the ones that, I, that I'll show you, they're ones that I've used, that I still do use. Uh, this is, I don't know what's going on here. I just won't move. I won't, I'm Italian. It's impossible for me to not to. Uh, um, <laughs> so, um, ah, I forget what I was saying now. Healthiest shortcuts. So that's what we were talking about. Oh, the, the products that I, when I, when I recommend a product or I highlight it or something, I, I, I'm not, no one endorses me. So don't worry about that. I don't, there's no, uh, no one's giving me any money to say any of these things. I am completely my own person. So, um, and that's what's fun about owning your own business. You can, you can do that. You can say, you know what? Your product sucks. <laughs> I couldn't say that when I was the high school principal. I, you know, I couldn't do that. Um, so soup facts, soup dates back to 20,000 BCE, and that's a long time. And the thing is, I'm going to explain what BCE is because I had to go look it up myself because it's different. We learned differently. We learned BC and AD, right? Before Christ and whatever the AD is, Edo, Aldo, whatever. Um, now it's, it's CE and BCE, so it's Common Era and BCE, Before Common Era. Generally speaking, common era is like around the year 1000 when they started keeping time. Okay, so this is 20,000 BCE. I mean, that's wow. You know, uh, the first canned soup was uh, was introduced in 1897 by Campbell's. Um, fan there's a fantastic um, series. I think it's on the History Channel, but you can probably get it like through Amazon. It's called The Food That Built America. Anyone, some of you seen that? There's a, I love it. It's, it's, and it's like Burger King, McDonald's, like how did they get to where they're at now? Uh, Lay's potato chips versus Pringles. How did they get there? And it was fascinating when they talked about soup. And um, it, I think it was Mr. Campbell's nephew, or so, if I remember correctly, who was actually kind of running the thing. But he hired these chemists. It, had, it was never even thought of that he could do a condensed soup. There was no such thing. And he did it because immediate, by condensing that soup, what he did is cut his shipping costs in half in, right off the bat. And that's, so you always, sometimes you don't think about how science interacts with things, but it's very interesting to me. Americans eat about 10 million bowls a year. You can do the next one, sure. 
Just so they can put it right. Just, yeah. Yeah, just put the other one on top. Keep your spoon. We're running out of spoons. <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely keep your napkin. We're definitely running out of those. Uh, Americans meet, eat about 10 million bowls of soup per year. And just kind of as a little fun fact, what do you think the first kind of soup was that archaeologists have discovered, you know, bones from certain mammals? And, uh, and they've, they've kind of, they're not 100% sure, but they're pretty sure this was the first soup. Anyone want to take a guess? Some it's a dinosaur. <laughs> hippopotamus. Hippopotamus. For some reason, they, they find a lot of hippopotamus uh, bones that have been scraped, and they think, for, for, for making soup. So, um, all right. So, yeah, the fact that they could bring one down. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what, that's what separated the humans from everyone else. We were able to work together in teams and, you know, do things like that. Um, so, some of the benefits of soup. So, when done properly... Homemade soup is one of the most nutritious things you can eat. It really is, as long as you do it properly. And notice I said homemade, not the stuff on the shelf. Um, broth-based soups are low-calorie. Now, if you fill a broth-based soup with bacon, it's not going to be low-calorie. But, but generally speaking, you know, if, think, if you think about it now, think about any broth-based soup you can think of, and chances are it's, it's low-calorie. Um, this is interesting. Eating a, a small amount of a broth soup before your meal causes you to eat less. And in some cases, it's like 30% less. Um, and they don't necessarily know why, but it just, it's just that. And it happens, it has to be a broth-based soup. If it's, if it's a, something else, it doesn't work well. Um, the benefit of making your own soup is you control the sodium content. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been doing these workshops now for... April will be two years. So this was a pandemic business. This was, I, um, I was, I call it blobbing around. I was just blobbing around my house during the pandemic. And I had my, my 24 year old nephew who would be here helping. Um, but they just had a baby. No, he should be at work. So <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You guys probably have a lot of you probably have great kids. So I don't have children. So I don't get to experience things like this, but this was a good one. So the baby was, his, his, his girlfriend is small, very tiny girl, petite. So they told, you know, they said, well, we have to reduce you because you're, the baby is, can't grow anymore without growing you. So she was scheduled to be induced Monday night. And so this would be Monday morning, two in the morning. My cell phone but it's not the phone, it's Facebook Messenger. So it's my nephew. And it says, she's having the baby now, what should I do? <laughs> so so, so I'm, first of all, I'm like, Facebook Messenger is the vehicle you picked to, to get in touch with me. You didn't pick up the phone, you didn't shoot me a text, you used Facebook Messenger. Okay, so I said, well, take her to the hospital. That's what I thought. And, and off they went. <laughs> So, so needless to say, he, he's got a few days off. Um, so, you know, it, it's an excellent soup is an excellent way to put more vegetables in your, um, in your diet, but it's, uh, it's also really, really good for you. Cooking at home is not only physically good for you, it's, it's mentally good for you, but it's also physically good for you, not just nutrition wise. It actually lowers your blood pressure, reduces anxiety. Um, there's been some studies. At, at <laughs> I, every time I bring this up, I think of this woman. I was down in, um, somebody down the Cape, and I said what I'm about to say next. I said, there's been some studies done on, uh, there's three things that you can do that uh, will prevent dementia and uh, kind of stave off anxiety and things. And there are three kind of regular things around the house, and they're, they're cooking, gardening, and light cleaning. And I no sooner got light cleaning out of my mouth than this woman goes, some man wrote that list. <laughs> right? She's probably not wrong. <laughs> but this is the big one. When you make something at home, it's better than anything you're going to buy shelf stable. And I, I guarantee you the worst homemade soup is better than the best canned soup. I guarantee it. All right? Now, this is, you know, I'm kind of a one-man mission lately as I've been doing, like I said, that's what I started to say. I've been doing this for closing it on two years. 
and I'm on a, kind of this one mission, one man mission about salt and sugar, um, because it, they're killing, they're absolutely killing us. Um, so you want to watch your sodium content. Salt contributes to inflammation. And I'll never forget when I was a little younger, I, I read this article and there was this, it was someone essentially, I realized now, now that I'm older, I realized they were trying to be smart just for the sake of being smart. And they were giving this argument of, well, there's no direct correlation salt to a heart attack, which this person is correct. There is no direct line. You can't go, oh, I've taken too much salt, and then you have a heart attack. That's, that doesn't happen. But there is a direct line from too much salt to inflammation to heart attack. It's very easy because when, when you're... When you're suffering from inflammation, which I do in a, in a real way, um, you not only do your fingers swell or your toes or your ankles, your internal organs can swell too. And they can become inflamed. And over time, that's bad. That becomes really, really bad. And that's why salt is bad for you. So when, whenever you hear somebody say, oh, salt doesn't affect you. No, it does affect you. You just don't feel it because it's your internal, internal organs that are getting inflamed as, a, as opposed to like your ankle or something. Um, you know, bullion is the worst. Avoid prepackaged seasonings. You know, these are all things that, that y you know. But this is shocking to me. This is half a can of soup. For, that's their serving size. That, who eats half a can of soup, right? I, I, they must really... You do? Okay, well. <laughs> I'll eat the other half for you. Um, you know, no, really. You know, you think about it. I realize there are some... I'm not one of them, but there are petite eaters. I, I do understand that. But, you know, you eat a can of soup and that's half your sodium for the day. 44% of your sodium for the day. That's ridic absolutely ridiculous. And this one, I was really surprised that this next one is not much better. This is that Amy's Organic, you know, that kind of makes itself out to be like, uh, you know, oh, well, the greatest thing. It's still 23% of your sodium for the day is in that, that can of soup. You know, so that's why, you know, when you make it homemade, you're better off. And when you're going to make a soup, it starts with the broth. So I'm going to kind of go through that. All right. So some of the, for, by this point, someone usually asks the, the, the question. So since, since no one has, I'll just, I'll ask it myself. What's the difference between a stock and a broth? Right. Does anyone know the answer? No, I'm so proud of myself that I know this. It's. <laughs> No, that's a stew. Yeah, you think of stew. Um, oh, you, you, you're close. Stock is just meat, broth, and water. That's it. And broth is meat, broth, and water, and other things, vegetables, season. But we use the term interchangeably, and I'm going to use the term interchangeably anyway. But it's just kind of a nice thing to, to you know, think about. So obviously you can make chicken stock. We're going to do kind of a deep dive on chicken stock today. Um, you can make vegetable beef. You can make stock out of, out of almost anything. Um, pork, you know, you can use fish, fish bones, shellfish, uh, corn. You can make, and I have the recipe in here. You can make a really nice stock out of the, the cobs from, a, a, a corn, from ears of corn. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you. Um, it's really, you, basically it's the same as making a stock. You just treat the, the cob like you would the bones. It's the same thing. Uh, then I'm going to show, A, I'm going to show you a mushroom stock. And the mushroom stock is, if you are, you know, unfortunate enough to be married to a vegetarian, like I was, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> the mushroom stock is a really good stock. If you, if you are a vegetarian or you know someone who is, or you're trying to cut meat out, but you kind of still want to feel like you have it a little bit in your diet, the mushroom stock is for you. And then you can make um, stocks out of scraps. You know, For example, vegetable stock, I only make vegetable stock out of scraps now because vegetables are so expensive. So, you know, pro, not, well, chicken's expensive too, but um, you know, it doesn't make much sense to me to go buy fresh, brand new produce just to make a stock out of it. So I just save the ends of carrots and I save the skins from the onions and the skins from garlic and all that stuff has flavor. And I just keep it in a big Tupperware thing in the freezer. And when it's full, I take it out and make a, a, a vegetable stock out of it. So, all right. So let's talk about how to make a, how to make a chicken stock. You all right over there, Mike? <laughs> oh, stop it. Trying to get more money out of me. <laughs> 
One more soup, one or the other. He wants a rib. Oh, now they're on his side. I knew it. We're on his side. Yeah, because he's serving the soup. That's why. <laughs> All right. So I, when I make a chicken stock, I actually do these. Most of these pictures, by the way, I took. So, you know, um, I hope you're impressed. Yeah, thanks. I was pretty impressed with some of them. It's just the iPhone. It's really amazing. Um, so, so I was, as I, since I have no life, I sit at home and I watched these like science shows about what's the best way to cook things and all that. And it was one of these test kitchens. And they did, should you put your vegetables in whole to make a stock? Should you rough chop them to make a stock? Or should you dice them? And I guess you can figure the answer since I start using this. Um, so the, the research came back as the smaller the dice, the more surface area of the water that it hits, therefore it's more flavorful. So uh, I can't tell you that it was an earth-shattering change, but I do do that um, now. So, and the, uh, the one that he's handing out now is uh, the white bean and spinach soup. That's, um, that's, probably be that's become our signature soup. That's the one that everywhere I go, people love it. It's, um, I sell prepared soups, and that's the one. That's the my number one that gets sold. Um, so I hope you I hope you enjoy it. How was the bisque? Did you like the tomato bisque? Yeah, it's good, yeah. You're gonna be surprised at what's in the tomato bisque, how easy it is, and how little cream, by the way. That, this, this pot right here makes, the bisque was in this one. So this makes five quarts. And uh, in this five quarts, there is a quarter of a cup of cream. That's it. That's the only, that's, and the other one doesn't have any cream or butter. Neither one has butter or anything. So, um, so I feel pretty good saying that it's healthy. So, um, so this is how I do it. My, uh, you know, my, um, my chicken stock recipe, uh, I swept most of it from Julia Child, who is, you know, if you know me, you know she's one of my idols. Um, Julia was just, just an absolutely great woman. Um, so... The two changes that I made over time, I didn't like sit at home and be like, I think I'll do this. I learned as I went. Um, Julie has called for three uh, cloves of garlic, just three. And I changed it to a whole bulb. So I put a whole bulb, I slice a whole bulb of garlic in half and put that in there. And to me, I think that adds a little of the sweetness because I don't put a lot of salt. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the... Um, the uh, uh, onion, the carrot, the celery, that was all the same. And then the peppercorns. Her, Julia's original recipe called for 10 peppercorns, exactly 10. And I do two plus tablespoons. So I like did the, you know, the pepper on steroids, which I think brings a little more flavor. And then you notice I have the half a teaspoon of kosher salt as optional. I actually, the picture you're going to see, it's in the picture but I've stopped using it altogether. I don't put any salt anymore. And part of the reason is there's salt in the chicken. There's sodium in the chicken already. So you, you, know, you want to keep that in, uh, in mind. So I, what I do now is I do all my cooking right to the end, and I make a big vat of stock, and then I salt it. And in fact, now that I do prepared foods, which we'll talk about that towards the end, I'm gonna, I might try to sell you some, um, what I do is I make that big batch unsalted. So now if someone says, I want a little salt, now I can add salt for them. But then everyone else gets low salt unless they say, so I do it the other way. Instead of you having to say, oh, I want low salt, you're getting low salt unless you tell me you want more. You know what I mean? It's kind of like that. Not always, but something. And then you can put a little uh, apple cider vinegar, just a little dash in there. And that's actually not for flavor. It's more for science. Um, there's some type of a chemical reaction that occurs and it's supposed to help some of the nutrients leach out of the bones. Uh, so, and I, that's as much as I know about that. So don't ask me any more, please. <laughs> so here's how I do it. I use, when I make a stock, and this is important, I use a whole chicken, but I only use a whole chicken if that stock is the star of the soup. So for example, one you're eating right now, that's homemade stock because that broth, that's the star of that soup, right? It's not the beans. It's not the spinach. It's the broth is what gives it the flavor. In the tomato, what was the star of the tomato soup? The tomato. the tomato. So I didn't use homemade stock there, right? You follow me? So that's 
That's the difference. Now, so what happens is when you use a whole chicken, the reason I do it is you get the full flavor uh, profile. So for example, the breast meat, and this is true of any meat, the meatier cuts, the breast in the case of chicken, is what gives it the chickeny flavor. So if you don't, if you don't put something meat in there, you're not gonna get that chickeny flavor. Same thing like when you make a, a beef stock, you should throw like a piece of chuck in there or something like that, or even stew beef, something that's meaty that will give it that meatier flavor. But then, you know, with the chicken, you also want the other cuts. You want, uh, you want the thighs that give a little, that gives a darker flavor. You know, the dark meat gives a little bit of a, a stronger flavor, but not too much. And then you want the collagen. You want that from the, uh... okay, well, that's, that's nothing I can do now. Um... Boy, I hate getting my age and forgetting what I was talking about. I used to remember everything. <laughs> Collagen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so the, the, um, the, believe it or not, the chicken feet have the most collagen. I didn't use chicken feet making this one. I, I don't do that to people because I know it kind of makes some people feel weird. But other cuts also have collagen, the wings, all of that stuff. So, so you definitely want to um, keep that in mind. All right. And so now what I do is like, like I said, I use the whole chicken and then I turn the oven up to uh, 400 degrees. I used to sprinkle it with the salt. See the salt? I don't do that anymore. Everything with this recipe is uncovered. So it goes in the oven for one hour uncovered. It could be a half hour. It could be an hour and a half. It doesn't, this part doesn't really matter. All you're doing is just some flavor you're not going to eat it right coming right out of the oven so it doesn't matter if it's undercooked because you you're going to simmer it for another two hours you know so you're going to do that and it's going to come out and then you're going to get this and sometimes uh i'll give you three guesses where that piece of skin in the middle went yeah. <laughs> so, sometimes it doesn't always make it to the pot um so now at this point you can do something and and this always causes a little bit of uh, consternation amongst folks, and, and rightly so. At the end of this, I throw everything away. All the meat, all the vegetables, everything. I throw the whole thing away. I do that for, for several different reasons, which I, I won't bother with you now, but trust me, that it's, for me, it works. You can, at this point, if you wanted to take it out from roasting, you could take the breasts out and use them for something else. But again, when I'm doing something that the, the broth is the star, I want the breast in there. You could also now simmer it for 20 minutes and then take the breasts out. And they, they wouldn't be overcooked and you could use them. You could simmer it for 20 minutes to a half an hour and deep, take it out and debone the whole chicken if you wanted. And then put it all, put the bones and stuff like that back in. That's, I clearly remember my grandmother doing that when I was a kid. You know, she'd have the, the newspaper spread out on the kitchen table and she'd put the boiled chicken there and she got every little bit and then the bones went back in the pot. I don't, I don't do that. Uh, mainly, um, I live alone. I can only eat so much chicken. The dog can only eat so much chicken. And the way I do it, it's, it's done. It's been, you know, roasted for an hour and then simmered for an hour and a half to two hours. There's not a lot of flavor or nutrient left in there. Uh, but if you're someone that wants to use that, and I, I understand that a lot of people are, and that's a good thing, um, you can make chicken salad with it. That's probably the the one, or maybe I've seen people do it like fajitas, like shred the chicken up with a couple forks and then use, use that meat as fajita meat. So, um, so anyway, so now what you're going to do is you have it out. And this is why I use my Dutch oven. You can see it kind of here in the corner, um, because I take it right out of the, the oven and I put it right on the stove top. I don't even take it out of this pot. And I think that's part of the flavor that because, um, you can see it kind of built up here. See it? So all I do is just add, add the water and the, the vegetables to this, right? And then you bring it up to a boil. You bring it up to a, a boil and um, you only let it boil for like just a second. You, and the, the reason is you don't want a rolling boil because if you leave it at a rolling boil, it's gonna disturb the chicken. And what happens is there's some sediment in the, in the bottom of the chicken. It's, it's not bad for you. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to change the flavor in any way, but it does cloud your broth up and it is, can be unappealing looking. So you definitely, you know, you don't, you don't want to stir it. You don't want to do any of that stuff. 
Um, so you once it's at a rolling boil, now you bring it right down to a simmer, and you bring it down to the lowest possible simmer that you can. So you know, just a couple bubbles at a time. Bloop, bloop. That's it. And then, as you're doing that, this foam is going to come up to the top, and you just want to remove the foam. Julia, in her recipe, uh, I've changed it from, she called it scum. So she <laughs> said, scrape the scum that comes to the top. Uh, so I, I changed it to foam. I think foam is a little more appealing, a little more appetizing. Um, same thing, if you don't remove it, nothing bad's going to happen. It's, you're not going to change the flavor. You're not going to change the taste. And there are times, like if I'm just making something for me, that I don't even bother with it. But, you know, generally speaking, if, if I'm making it for other people or I want a really clear stock, I make sure of this. It's going to evaporate as you're simmering it. Add more water. You're not, you're not diluting it. So add more water. So, and you'll see it. Like the side of the pan, you'll see like it's kind of stained where the water is kind of simmered down. Just bring it right back up there. I generally have to add about two or three cups of water as I go, just to keep that the level of broth. And, and even if you do water it down, I'm going to teach you how to fix that at the end. All right? So now when you're all done, like I said, I strain and discard all the solids. And I just use a, a wire mesh strainer. And, um, you know, I let everything cool. Because one time I put everything, it was hot, and I put it outside. My neighbor called me and said, your rubbish is on fire. And it wasn't. It was just the steam. But uh, <laughs> So I have a new neighbor now who has a, a, some type of burning stove. And it kicks my basement, and it kicks sparks out. I don't know if you've ever seen that. So I saw her in the, in the backyard. Hey, hey Diane, you're... You think's kicking sparks all over the place. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we know. It's okay. I was like, well, no, it's really not. I live here. I, you know, I, there's leaves and stuff down there. You know, oh, all right, I'll tell so-and-so. And I don't know if they fixed it or not. But anyway, strain it and discard. And then you're going to refrigerate it overnight. And then you're going to have this. All right? So you're going to have this layer of fat at the top. This is why I don't buy organic chicken. Because everything I've read about organic or about chickens and birds is that they carry their impurities in their fat. And really, the, the one that I'm most concerned about is antibiotics. That's, that's the big one for me. Um, so it's, I'm told that that's where they, that, that they store it. So, uh, so I feel comfortable with that. You're skimming the fat off and throwing it away. Um, some people use the fat. You know, I've seen people fry onions and things like that in it. Now, this is what it should look like, right? It should look like jelly, all right? And to different layer, levels of it, you know, the more collagen you have. So if you had this one, I guarantee you this stock, this is one of the few pictures that I didn't take. I guarantee you this stock has chicken feet in it, I guarantee, because the, the feet are loaded with this type of collagen. Um, so now at this point, you've, you've refrigerated it, you've taken the fat off, now you're tasting it, and you decide, oh, it's bland. So if it's too bland, you have two things you can do. You can, add, you can heat it up, you can add more salt, or you can heat it up and turn it up really high and bring it to boiling and reduce it down by about a third. That's how I do it. And then you're not adding more sodium. All right? So, that's, so reduce it down. You're concentrating the flavor a little bit. Um, and then if it's too salty, anyone know some tricks for that? Potato, yeah. Throw a potato in there, yeah. What else? Any other tricks? Apple, yeah. I've heard apple. Okay, good. All right, so that's, that's how I make the chicken stock. And I'm going to give you a couple quick vegetarian stocks, and then we'll get to some of the recipes. So this is the corn stock. This is really, really good. Um, and again, this is, you know, this is this recipe. You could use anything you want, as long as you have the, you know, the corn cobs. Uh, anything else is negotiable, but the the interesting thing about this recipe is towards the kind of the bottom half, the yellow onion is charred before you before you cook with it before you put it in the stock, uh, and that really adds a nice flavor, a nice kind of smoky flavor to it. Um, and then the rest of it is just that just you know you do your thing with it, let it simmer away. Um, you only anything that's vegetable based, you only need to simmer it for about half hour. Uh, even vegetable stocks, you could 20 minutes, you could get you could get by with it. Say with chicken, you know, chicken is two hours. That's it. You know, you hear people, oh, I, I 
my chicken went 24 hours. Okay, well, you wasted 22 of your, the hours of your life because you just need two hours, because their bones are thin. So they give, they give everything up easily. Beef, yeah, that one can go 24 hours. You know, those bones are a lot thicker. Um, so this is, how, this is how you make this. And I just want to call attention to, as we go through the recipes, I have this kind of thing that I do where I put, whenever I put, add stock or broth or water, I always give a window of six to eight or four to six. And I do that because some people like a thicker broth, some people like a thinner stew. I also do that and I save a little bit because sometimes when you put it in the refrigerator overnight, it kind of sucks up some of the So I add the, um, I add the extra stock in, in the morning. Okay. This is the mushroom stock. This is really, really surprisingly good. The, the two big highlights here are you have to really saute the mushrooms a good long time. And I think it only says like 15 minutes in, the, uh, in, in this recipe. I would go even more, a half hour, because if, if you've sauteed mushrooms before, you know the minute you start to saute them, it, they release all their water and it looks like they're in soup. You got to get rid of that. So you just keep going and that will burn off and then you'll have the real, the mushroom flavor. And then the only, the other thing I like to call attention to is use of soy sauce, Worcestershire sauce, and fish sauce. If you don't like those things, like I'm sure there are people, oh, fish sauce, yuck. And that's okay. If you don't like it, don't use it. You know, just use, use the other stuff. Um, but I would give fish sauce a try if you have, well, you probably have had it. You just don't know it. Um, because most Asian restaurants, it's, it's in most of their sauces that they have. Just a drop. You know, it's really, really strong. And believe it or not, a lot of Italian restaurants use it in red sauce. Um, they'll put a little drop of that instead of adding more salt. Um, so all you're going to do is you're just going to do this, and then you're just going to simmer it until everything is kind of nice and soft. And then if you really want flavor, when you, when you strain it, take like a wooden spoon and smush like through the strainer, and you'll get some of the, the fiber and the solids and things in there. And that's all flavor too. All right, and then of course you have a vegetable stock. You can you can do a vegetable stock two ways. You can roast it first and to get a little more of a depth of flavor, and then make the stock. Or you can just dump the vegetables in, and you'll have a little a lighter stock. Which, by the way, you can do the same thing with chicken. Like I roast my chicken for an hour. I do that on purpose because I want a darker, more flavorful stock. You could just use a raw chicken in your stock, and you're just going to get a little bit of a lighter stock. That's all. Um. So again, you know, the, the vegetables, 20 minutes, simmer them for 20 minutes, and, and they're, they're done. You want to avoid, uh, brassicas are like cauliflower, broccoli, things like that. You want to avoid those. You want to avoid beets. Um, potatoes, you avoid. Peels are okay. Potato peels are fine. There's actually, there's a recipe floating around the internet called potato peel soup. Um, and I haven't tried it yet, but it looked pretty good, actually. Um, although I see some restaurants now use, like, potatoes, they the little potato strips, potato peels, they sell them like potato skins, but they crisp them up. So, all right, so let's, let's look at some recipes. So now you've got some stocks. So now you, you know, you've got, you know, s some stuff in your arsenal here. All right. And we're going to, so this is the, the one you just had. All right. Did you like that one? Good. Yeah. I like that one too. So the secret to this one is the second to the bottom uh, bullet. It's a Parmesan Reggiano cheese rind. And you, you, you cut the rind off and you simmer the rind in the soup. And then, you, you know, when you're done, you just fish out whatever's left. And if you forget to fish it out and someone gets it, you just go, oh, you won. <laughs> it's your lucky day. <laughs> Do you think I've done that? Yeah. I've done it. <laughs> I also, one day I was, I was all set to leave the house and I made the tomato soup. And I, I use fresh thyme, so I, you know, bundle it together. And I bundle it together with thick butcher's string so I don't forget it. And I forgot it. And I took the hand blender and went, and then it just, it was like a motorboat, like hitting seaweed, you know. Was, so I had to start that one over. But this, yep. Yeah. I added carrots. Yeah, I added them. So that, you know, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's the beauty of soup is you just kind of, you know, add things here and there. Um, this one, for example, I didn't use uh, Great Northern. I used cannellini, although it says cannellini too. 
You can use, I used spinach, you could use escarole, you could use Swiss chard, you could use lettuce if you wanted to. A lot of the older Italian um, soups call for lettuce as the green as opposed to like spinach and things like that. So, um, and this one I think, oh yeah, it does have carrots. Yeah. Uh, but you could add, no, I've, I've added, by the way, this is a really cool thing to add, parsnips. Um, I do that with beef stew. I, add, I, I put a, some parsnips in there, and every time people are like, what is that? And no one can ever figure out what it is, but it's, it's a nice flavor. Um, so, you know, mess around, because again, we talked earlier, soup is one of the, the best places to add some vegetables. So you could add in, I could see uh, like zucchini or yellow squash working well in there. I mean, you could, almost anything works. I've done it a couple, couple times. I've added a can of diced tomatoes, you know, just to add another little layer of things in there. This is the next one here. This is one I sometimes bring. This is probably my second favorite soup. Um, I'm actually I'm thinking about calling this one a different name. I think I'm going to call this one superfood soup because um, it has, I mean, you know, yeah, carrot, celery, they're good for you. Garlic is a superfood. You know, uh, tomatoes are a superfood, but then it also has turmeric in it. And I don't know if uh, if any of you uh, take turmeric as a supplement or anything. I've just started doing it myself. Um, if you're not familiar with turmeric, it's, uh, it's a spice like kind of like, um, it looks like ginger, you know, like that, like a knobby kind of root type spice. And um, it's, it, it is not thought to, it does do the same thing as right now, 14 prescription drugs that are currently on the market. Turmeric does the exact same thing. And most of it is around inflammation, which is why I'm starting to take it, and digestion, digestive health. So the only thing I would suggest with turmeric is check with your doctor because it can have interactions with other medications that you might be on. Does anyone take a turmeric supplement? A couple of people. Okay, yeah. Um, so anyway, so this is a really good one. And then at the end of this one, um, you always do two things at the end. Whenever you have a leafy green of any kind, that's the last thing you put in. So for example, when I was getting this soup ready this morning, everything went into this pot, which I'm gonna tell you about these, these cookers in a minute. They're a little bit different than what you probably have seen before. Um, but everything went in the pot, and I just put the lettuce, uh, the lettuce, the spinach right on top and shut it. And I didn't, it didn't keep cooking or anything. And that will keep the, the freshness, that fresh flavor. Same thing with herbs. Always put your herbs in your leafy green herbs at the end. If they're dry, you're gonna put them in at the front because they need time to you know, get in the, the, into the water. Um, but fresh, you should always put in right at the end. And then, um, like I said, the, uh, the turmeric. And then that last one there, this is a little, that's a restaurant trick, right, Michael? You know that trick. Add a little drizzle of like red wine vinegar or even just a little bit of lemon juice, some, a little olive oil sometimes too. Um, just a little bit of way of kind of kicking it up a little bit. So, and I, normally I would do that. I would, normally I would add a little olive oil to the, um, to the white bean and spinach. A little drizzle of that is nice. But, uh, but first, it's, uh, it's really time consuming to do. And when there's, you know, 50 people, that it's kind of hard. And second, um, I, I'm trying to be like, the less we touch anything, the better. I'm trying to kind of keep hands off of things. And that's why everyone, you know, you get your own spoon and that type of thing. So, and by the way, like that home economics teacher I was talking about earlier, if you have a suggestion to do it better, please let me know. I'm always open to that. But this is a great one. And you use um, red lentils. And the reason I use red lentils is red lentils break down. So they're really, really good for soup. They actually, within like 15, 20 minutes, they kind of break down and get a little bit mushy. So it, it really adds to, to the soup. Whereas black lentils, green lentils, you know, they hold their shape a little bit more. You can, you can still use them, but they do hold their shape a little bit. Um, this one is, uh, I prefer, this is a thin seafood chowder. And this is, this is my recipe that, you know, I've been kind of playing around with for a while. You can thicken it up if you want. You know, add, uh, you could do a roux you know, butter and cream or something like that. Uh, butter and cream. Um, flour and butter would be a roux, or you could add some, some more cream if you wanted. I didn't add any cream to this. Um, and I actually, I liked it like this way better. For me, the, um, the real, you know, flavor here comes from the Old Bay seasoning. 
um, which I've tried to recreate like a hundred times. I just can't do it. It's so I just gave up. I said, well, it's perfect. <laughs> no sense trying to recreate it. But this is a really good one. And you can add the, um, the shellfish, the shrimp, the mussels, all that stuff if you want. But you can also, one of the things is um, with fish, all you have to do with this, I use haddock. All you have to do is just, it just needs to like touch the hot water and it's cooked. So you just put the haddock in, you know, literally count to 10 and then take it off the heat and it's, it's done. Any more than that, it'll be a little too flaky. Um, but this is a really good recipe. This is a very popular one. Um, I sell a lot of this in the prepared soups. Um, this is one you can roast the butternut squash or not. I find when I do it with the ginger, I don't roast the squash because the ginger is really the star of it as opposed to the, if it was just a butternut squash, I would probably roast that. But you can do it either way. It doesn't really matter. Um, and I always put a little pinch of cayenne. As a matter of fact, the potato soup you had had a little pinch of cayenne. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but um, any, any type of red sauce or any type of, uh, even like an orange soup like that, I always add just a little bit of cayenne. And cayenne is a nice heat. Like red pepper is what they would call like a front heat. The, you know, the minute you taste red, minute it hits your tongue, you know, it's oh, you're like, oh, I feel the burn. Whereas cayenne, it's kind of like afterwards, and it's a little, a little slower. So it kind of develop, helps the flavor develop a little bit more. But this is a really nice soup. And this one, I did one year, uh, I, the first year I did it, and now I do it every year at the end of the year with my garden. And I just wait till, you know, depending on the weather, you know, late September, early October, you know, some years I've gone into December, it's been so nice. And then I just go out and I just grab whatever's left of herbs and I just pull them all out and I essentially just mix them together with, you know, whatever else I have, some chicken stock or vegetable stock, and then I blend it up. Um, and it's really good. And I've done it three or four years in a row now. I've used all different herbs. It tastes different every time, but it's a really, it's a good way to get rid of all those herbs at the end of the year. And if you're a gardener, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> all right, here's, this is the tomato bisque. So this is the one that you had. Um, theirs is a little more orangey. I, that's because a little more cream. But I, to be honest, I like it with less cream. I like the tomato. I, the tomato flavor, I think, comes out a little bit more. Um, so, so this one, I, um, I didn't use. What didn't I use? I didn't use basil. I didn't use any basil. I used thyme. I tend to use thyme instead, um, mainly because I grow it in my, in my, on my countertop, so it's right there. But you could use any herb you want. You could use Italian seasonings. Just mix Italian seasonings to make it easy. And this, this next slide, this is a new kind of way of looking at recipes. Kind of give people a visual of, of <laughs> you know, what it looks like. So that, with the exception of the chicken stock, is not there. That's, that's that tomato bisque that you had. That's it. And all that, really, all that flavor, you know? So it's, um, and that's, it's one onion. And it wasn't in the recipe, the one carrot, but I, I just added it because I happened to have it. And um, if you're at all interested, that's, I actually use the food processor to get them that like that. And it's, and this is trial and error. It's seven pulses. <laughs> not eight, not six, it's seven. <laughs> but if you have, if you have a, a Thing. You know what I mean? The bzz, bzz, bzz. Seven times seems to get it to, to like the size, at least for me, to the size that I want. Whenever I go over that, I end up with mush. So, um, but yeah, and I, like I said, the recipe, most of the recipes call for heavy cream uh, when you're making like a, a creamy soup. I always use light cream. It, it's never really even occurred to me to use heavy cream and no one has ever said anything to me. So, um, so some tips to make your soup healthier. Uh, I keep forgetting, I have to change this slide. When I say plant-based proteins, I don't mean that Beyond Meat stuff. Everyone thinks that's what they, what, oh, you mean that, that fake sausage? No, I don't mean that. <laughs> that, <laughs> that. That stuff is bad for you. I mean, that's, I, I don't know if you, if you eat it, I, you know, I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but it is, you know, it's, it's, it's loaded with chemicals and sodium and all that stuff. It really is. It's just, you know, they've, if you, it's, Someone, I just heard it. Processed food is still processed food. Somebody just said it. Um, 
you know, and that and that's the thing, you know, have have something real, just have a small smaller amount of it, you know, like like pasta. One of the things that I'll I oh actually I'd probably have it yeah use lentils and beans instead of pasta. It's halfway down on the bullet. I learned that from a nutritionist. I went in to see. I'm actually I'm, I'm down about 20 pounds, and she one of the things. <laughs> It was funny. She asked me to write down everything. She'd write down everything you eat. I said, okay. And she hated it all except the soup. She zeroed right down on the soup and she went, okay, soup is good. That's great. Keep, keep eating the soup. Just get rid of the pasta and put beans and lentils in there instead. And you'll be all set. And, I did, and I'm Italian and I did it and I never look back. I don't, I don't miss the pasta at all, but that was my earlier point. If I do want pasta, I'm going to go and have a little real piece, a little bit of pasta. I'm not going to get whole wheat pasta. I'm going to get, you know what I mean? I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not, so, you know, I'm not. So who, who was the president that was like, I'm not going to eat broccoli. Who, who was that Bush? Did he say, yeah, yeah. Boy, did you ever think you'd miss him? <laughs> Cause I do. I never thought, dude, I'm serious. Did you ever think you'd say that? I mean, this is the guy that they threw a shoe at, remember? That looks presidential now. <laughs> All right, easy, David, easy. Okay. Um, use turmeric and herbs and things like that. Herbs have a lot of um, nutritional value too, uh, particularly uh, basil and even parsley. It's high in vitamin K, things like that, so... Um, don't discount herbs. Herbs bring a lot to the table. Um, kale, spinach, like I said, any leafy green, just add just before serving. Is it the, um, spice that's dried or is it the bulb? That so the question is, is the turmeric dried or do you use the, 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 the bulb? I use dried turmeric. I just buy, I buy it. But you can use the bulb if you want. You, could, you can grate it if you wanted to grate fresh turmeric right in there. It's to completely up to you. They, by the way, they both have the same exact benefits, whether it's fresh or dry. Garlic is the same thing. You get the same benefits from garlic powder that you get from actually gar from real eating real garlic. Well, garlic powder is real garlic. It's just dehydrated. Um, again, the vinegar lemon juice thing. And then I do this one all the time as someone, you know, as a single guy, live alone. I do. I keep a bag of mixed frozen vegetables in my freezer, and I just, whatever I'm making, I just have nothing. I've reached it in and grabbing a handful and throwing it in there. I figure, hey, it's, you know, a handful more vegetables than I would have had. All right. How are we doing? For, oh, we're right on time. Although I got nowhere to go. We could sit here all day. I stayed in Princeton for, I stayed for almost two hours. We're, it's supposed to be an hour, and I'm out. And um, I think part of it is they were so thirsty for discussion because they'd been cooped up in their houses without power for two days. <laughs> so, so I felt bad leaving them. But um, so anyway, so, so remember, you know, I mentioned, you know, when I come across a good product or a good idea or something like that, you know, a good idea is a good idea. So I, I like to share it. Um, so freezing your soups, that's something that, that I've started doing a lot of. Um, particularly when I do like prepared uh, soup that I sell, I actually make the soup to order. What I do is I make the stock. I make a big giant batch of the stock. Like I said, I make it unsalted. And then I just make the soup. So if you order a quart, I just take a quart of the stock out of the refrigerator and make the soup with that quart and put it right back in. Uh, but I use these. I use these paper containers. Here's one right here. So like this is a quart one right here. So um, you can get them at Restaurant Depot, but you have to buy like 150 of them. So you might, you might want to try Amazon instead. But what I do is if, I, um, if I'm making soup for myself, I'll take one of these out of the freezer because I will have not remembered to defrost it in the morning. So I'll just pull it out and I'll cut up my vegetables and I'll saute them. And then I just peel the cardboard off of this and I have a big block of soup and I just drop it. I drop that right in there and it just melts and simmers in the vegetable, the vegetables simmer in it and it's done. Um, you can use mason jars. They take up a lot of room, but they work well. If you do freeze with mason jars, you should use the wide mouth ones, not the ones that have the narrower shoulder, the narrow opening, because those, those tend to crack. I speak from experience there and I see a couple of heads nodding too. Uh, beans, lentils, and rice all freeze better than pasta. Much better. And, and they're 
they're better for well at least the the beans and the lentils are um rice if it's brown is better for you uh broth soups and meaty soups like beef stew things like that freeze really really well pureed soups freeze really well the only thing with a pureed soup is for example the tomato bisque has that cream in it what i would do what i do is i make it the soup i make the soup i blend it then i add the cream if i was going to freeze it i wouldn't add the cream just freeze it like that and then add the cream when you heat it up that's that's a good tip with uh with pureed soups and uh sometimes it's better like i said to just freeze the stock and then make the soup you know with just some fresh ingredients all right some shortcuts here you guys seen this better than bullion so here's the thing it's but just right off the bat let's it's loaded with salt loaded however don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's a good product and it tastes fantastic so here's what you do i see that face you're making over there you use one quarter of what they what they tell you to use okay so if if they call you know if it calls for four teaspoons use use one and then you can add a little more if you need it but that again now the other the, um, the tomato was here that was one tablespoon of that that's on this whole thing you know so so it, it's strong it's very strong but it's very very salty and they make other flavors they do make a low sodium one but to be honest with you the difference is i mean it's like one of them has 40 percent sodium and one of them has like 32 percent so i mean it <laughs> doesn't matter because you're going to use a quarter of that anyway so that's that's what i do as long as again moderation and this is a shortcut this isn't something you would eat every day this is something if you know you're like oh i got to whip something together um they do have organic and vegan options um great for stew, stew sauces all that stuff like i said it's very high in sodium as for a stock i like this one i get um i get the obviously the unsalted version um, which is good if you're going to reduce it down like make a sauce or gravy or something you want it to be unsalted um, and I would have probably up until about a month ago, I, this is the only one that I were, would have recommended. And then I was in Costco and this is their house brand in Kirkland. Do you guys know about Kirkland? Yeah. yeah. It's um, like, I don't, I don't, I don't drink, but when I did, um, their vodka, the Kirkland vodka is great goose. You know, <laughs> it is, yeah, it's amazing. Really. Their, uh, their, wine is uh clos du bois which is uh which is a pretty decent wine um so anyway i really liked this and it had even less sodium than the other one so that's it's a good brand um i always you know i don't know what a i love it when i come across like use your ribbon grater to to cut your garlic. i don't even know what a ribbon grater is um let alone do i have one this is what i use for the butternut squash and ginger soup um you can get it with um some of it has salt in it and some you can get it unsalted so i try to get the unsalted when i can um but this is you can find this where the garlic is in the supermarket it's all right there and once you oh it's shelf stable but once you open it it you have to you have to refrigerate it but it's pretty good and um again and i make you know big batches at a time so in a five or a six batch, two two tablespoons of this that's that's about it because it's pretty strong um if you're a soup person you need one of these you should definitely have a, an immersion blender um it really makes pureeing soups much easier and star of today is this the thermal cookers have you guys heard of this no i bet you haven't i hadn't either so i used to when i was doing these i used to bring the soup in these which I'm going to show you these. These are awesome too. But I was I had to bring like 15 of these and they're 20 bucks a piece. So so one day Mansfield called me uh one afternoon and I I go I'm in Mansfield every month and they called and they said, "Oh, Dave, um we forgot to cut off registration." And I said, "Oh, that's all right. How many? 75 people." <laughs> <laughs> so clearly the those things weren't going to work anymore. So I I was like something there's got to be someone has to have invented something that you can carry large amounts of soup around hot and I searched and I searched I couldn't find I couldn't find I couldn't finally I found these thermal cookers in the camping department and what they are is you 
Ooh, this is the messy one. See this? So you put this on the stove top. This is the soup, drip everywhere. And you bring it to a boil. You don't even have to finish cooking it. You just bring it to a boil, and then you put it in the thermal cooker, and you shut it. And it uses the steam to create like a pressure cooker type thing. And it will stay so far. It's, it's hours. I've had stuff stay hot. Because sometimes I in the morning and one in the afternoon, and I never go home. I'm in the car all day. So um, this is 70 bucks. But they're, you know, and you might not, you know what they use them for? Tailgating. <laughs> Chili and stuff. Oh, look where I am in Walpole telling you about tailgating. <laughs> I'm not a tailgater, so. Do, if you live in Walpole, do you hate football fans? Yes. You, some, I see some yes and some no. Okay, all right. They hate the traffic. Okay, yeah, all right, that makes sense. That makes more sense, yeah. Mike's a Miami Dolphins fan. <laughs> I could tell, she says. <laughs> So um, this thermal cooker, you, you probably don't need one, but I'm just so impressed with it, I threw it in the, in the, in the presentation. Um, and then this is the Stanley one. I love these Stanley products right here. These were around, so I think since like 1913. Um, and you've seen this new one, the Yeti. Have you seen these? Yeah, that, yeah that's yuppie is what it should be called. Uh, <laughs> Um, this, this was the original Yeti right here. Um, and then, you know, as we kind of come to the end, there is one product that has absolutely changed the cooking world. I, and I, I'm ashamed that you guys don't know more about this, to be honest. I feel bad for you. So that's my cookbook, <laughs> my recipe book. If you can't read the quotes, I'll read them to you. <laughs> Become a Soup Master is the single greatest collection of soup recipes known to mankind. Dave is a genius and quite handsome. <laughs> Dave's mom. <laughs> and then, I wish I was still around to enjoy these recipes that are all way better than mine. Julia Child said that. <laughs> From the grave, she said that. Uh, <laughs> So you can get that at Amazon. I might have a few copies with me up here if you're at all in, in so inclined. Um, on a serious note, you know, as I look out and there's, there's 50 plus of you here, um, thank you very much for coming out because one of the things that you don't, probably don't even know you're doing it, you're supporting a small business just by coming here because if you don't come out and I was standing here and there's three of you, they wouldn't have me back, <laughs> right? <laughs> So when you come out, and even a day like today, and I want you to know, I truly appreciate that. A day like today, it's very easy. I did it today. I was like, well, I don't want to. It's crappy out, right? And it's really easy for you. I had to come here, but it's really easy for you to sit home and say, ah, you know, there'll still be other people there. You know, so I do, I appreciate you coming out. Some other ways you can um, help small businesses is buy local. Um, spread the word. Tell your friends. Keep coming to events like this. Uh, if you're on social media, we do have a, a Facebook page. And believe it or not, those things matter to small businesses. Um, you know, the number of people that interact with your page directly relates to how high you are in a search. So, for example, when I first started this business, oh, this is funny, uh, before I even get to that. When I first started the business, I was, it was, thera it was therapy, uh, therapeutic gardens that was it was first that and then my business partner was like no one's going to know how to spell therapeutic you have to make it therapy gardens i was like oh yeah that makes sense you know it does make sense so um so I, I i started the company and i got a website and all that stuff and i used to be on the planning board of the city of brockton so i still have friends on there so i'm emailing them and no one's answering me no one's answering me no so finally i called and i'm like why aren't you getting my emails and he said i don't know Call the IT people. So I called the city and I said, hey, I live in the city. I own a business in the city. Why am I blocked from every, everyone I want to send that works for the city? So the nice kid, he says, oh, uh, it's going to take a couple days. I'll get back to you. And I thought, oh, can, I'll never hear that. I'll never hear from him again. And did he call me back like three days later? And he goes, okay, it's all set. Uh, you're unblocked. No problem. So I said, well, why? Why was I blocked? And he said, oh, he said, 
we subscribe to a subscription service that blocks, you know, pornography and things like that. Um, yeah. And he, <laughs> he goes, Therapy Gardens, it thought you were a marijuana company. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense, right? So, uh, hey, maybe they're onto something. I don't know. This, this is a raised bed. This is an, in what I call an indoor community garden bed. And it's, it has lighted at the top. And it's individual, so you can put like individual plants and take them out, and all that stuff. And it's on wheels, so it, you know. And uh, I was going to make millions and millions on this. I was like, oh, man, this is it. This is my big idea. And that's the prototype that I ended up donating to the Plymouth Senior Center because no one bought any. So, <laughs> so, um, so anyway. And the last thing I just want to tell you about it, I, you know, I... This is new, and this is a happy accident, by the way. I don't do these soup things so I can sell you soup. I really don't. But I was at, I think you mentioned earlier, I was, one of my um, customers is an over 55 um, community in Weymouth. And I'm there every month. And um, I did this one. And we were all done. And one of the women says, this is great. This is just wonderful. But we don't cook. <laughs> I said, well, then why did you sit here through this whole thing? So they said, they said, you cook for us. So I've started doing it. I've started selling prepared soups. And put it to the, I'm spending tomorrow making tons of, I've only been doing this for two weeks, and I already have like, like 15 orders, which is great. I mean, I'm not complaining. It's excellent. I make my lazy nephew go deliver it. Um, but how it, how it works, and I have some info up here if you want it. Oh, I wanted to pass out just before I do that. Uh, if you want to uh, sign up for um, an email, Mike, if you just hand these just like one down each row or something. I, what I do is I don't, uh, I don't sell you, try to sell you things. I actually just tell you when I'm going to be in your area um, because I, I go to a bunch of different senior centers and I, I know people bop around to different ones and the libraries and things like that. So you'll know, you know if I'm near you. And then um, I do do the, uh, the soup group. So this is the new thing we're calling is a soup group. As long as you order by Thursday, as long, so all you have to do is either... Um, you can call, you can email, uh, or you can go online, either one. And I have everything up here, so you don't even have to write it down. I'll, I'll give you a handout if you want. Uh, it's, 16, it's $16 per quart. That's delivered. That's delivered. Um, and then it's, so three quarts would be $48. <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> every, it's this place calling you. Oh, that's very nice of them. Um, so I'm doing a workshop special today that it's uh, everything, like I said earlier, is made to order. So uh, I have up here, you can check if you want less salt. You can, you know, whatever you want. As long as you tell me by Thursday, I'll have it to you by Saturday. If you buy three quarts today, I'm going to give you a free Therapy Gardens t-shirt. Look at this. It'll come with your order. Isn't that nice? Let's grow. <laughs> so, you know my, my shiftless nephew that I was telling you about? Actually, he started out my lazy nephew. And then at one of these, someone made a mistake and called him my shiftless nephew. And I said, that's better. So, sh so now he's known as my shiftless nephew. But he said to me, when I had these, I had a thousand of these made up, right? A thousand, all different sizes and everything. So people weren't buying them, which is why I'm giving them away with the soup. And he said to me, he goes, you know where you went wrong? And I said, no, Einstein, where I went wrong. I own the business. What do you own? He said, you work with old people, of which he means me too, just so we're clear. I said, yes. He said, you should have had little baby kids ones made up, and they'd buy them for their grandkids. And I said, you're right. As much as I hate to admit it, he was right. But he should have thought of it before I printed a thousand of the adult ones. He wasn't a hundred percent right. But anyway, um, so if you're interested, I'm going to hang out up here. If you you know want some information, I have a handout that you can just take with you, and I have an order form if you want to order something today. If you want to buy a book, they're up here. They're they're like I said, they're ten dollars, and that is the presentation. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. <laughs> Thank you. Um, listen, you guys have a great. Day. And if ever I can help you, let me know. And has all recipes as well, too. So thank you. Have a great day.